Good morning, Lango Getters, and happy Lunar New Year. I'm Lisa. I'm the sociolinguist and the Korean instructor at Lango Institute. Sehe uh, bomani badeseo. I'm Peter. I'm also a linguist at Lango Institute. Feliz ano novo. Welcome to LangoPod, everyone. I'm Tyler. I teach Chinese and a couple other languages at Lango, and I'm also streaming now and am the resident philologer of Lango. Indeed. All right. So today uh, we're discussing transitivity, and the title of today's podcast is Eat, Bite, Kick, Transitivity for the Language Learner. Um, an eat, bite, kick is a nod to a book and a movie and a movie called Eat, Pray, Love. And the name of the author is Elizabeth Gilbert, Elizabeth Gilbert. Uh, but since today's podcast is about transitivity, we tried to pick uh, verbs that we perceived to be high in action. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the semantics of transitivity, but high in transitivity. Uh, so this worked out a little bit better than eat, pray, love, which are more ambiguous for transitivity. Okay, you can so see that in our cool uh, stylistic rendering representation of the word transitivity here. Indeed, for anybody watching, you are um, very fortunate to get this wonderful <laughs> uh, iconic aesthetic that we have here with our title. So before we get into what transitivity is, um, it's useful to remember the notion of the phrase and the notion of the clause. So, and we've discussed this in the previous podcast. So uh, the phrase is the basic or fundamental syntactic unit, right? So, uh, and phrases build clauses, right? So a phrase can be one word or built of many words. A clause contains one or more phrases, right? So, uh, right, even a clause, so you see that you can have one or more phrases inside a clause and one or more words inside a phrase. Just like in a morpheme, you could have one or more morphemes within a word. So, so how, think, what's that? I was just gonna note, you put it here on the, on the slide that uh, you have one instance of inflection, tense aspect per clause. Is that, just a, is that equivalent to saying that a clause requires a verb or can you have verbless ones that still have tense and aspect marked? Okay, so, um, right, we were just about to say that you can recognize a phrase because they will have one instance of inflection per clause. Um, and in my experience, working with oceanic languages, which can have verbless clauses, you can still, you would know, right, the tense and aspect of the clause, even if there's not a verb, mm. right? Although I think most of the major world languages will have some sort of verb in there. So English, for example, has be verbs, but not every language uses be for existential phrases and clauses. So in English, you will get be, uh, and even you will get, well, we can talk about it more another time, but you can even get things like um, it's raining, mm -hmm. which is inflected, but you know, it's is an empty subject and rain is really the thing that's raining and such. So you can get, um, in English, we want to have certain things such as a verb, if we're going to inflect something, for example, and we want to have overt subjects and things like that. So it's a good example language to study syntax because you can see a lot of the movement and stuff. And more on that on the blog soon. Yes. We'll more on... Uh, phrases. So an example, uh, the last thing on this slide, if you're watching, is that uh, I will be going to the store is one inflection, right? So you might think will is an inflection, be is an inflection, and going is an inflection. But those three words together inflect future progressive. So that's what we mean when we say there's one inflection per clause. Uh, we're combining tense and aspect and mood. If your language expresses mood, we would probably be combining that as well. So, now, I, yep. Another question. Is this part, the part to the store, is that part of the clause beginning with will in your view? So the clause in my view 
begins with I, and I will be going to the store, and ends with to the store. Okay. Right. So there the whole thing is a clause, and the structure within it under a structural approach, um, maybe right. uh, to the store will be a different a different. Um, it will be its own prepositional phrase. Right. But I still probably think it's. Now we've got to argue whether that's a complement to the verb, I suppose. But for the simple presentation, we can say that is, but it's just, we'll get more into it in a second. What does it mean to be a core and non-core argument? Um, but before we get too much into it, uh, I should tell you what transitivity is. Oh, hold on, I've got a joke. <laughs> okay. Urgent uh, joke here. Why shouldn't you touch a clause with bare hands? It'll scratch uh, you. Huh? Oh, structure. that's a good one too, Tyler. I like that too. Uh, risk of inflection. Risk of inflection. <laughs> and All now, right. to, oh, now oh. we can go on. <laughs> well, let's not let's not go on though, real just yet. Um, since yeah. we're contrasting phrases and clauses here, I've outlined on the slide what some phrases are with brackets. Oh, nice. Whole thing is one clause. I, th I think that's accurate to say. But as you said a moment ago, these are made up of multiple phrases. Not every string of words that, that occurs together is a chunk, right? If we, we have the string going to the in this, but that's not meaningful. That's not, that doesn't hang together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember our OCM, right? Only chunks move. That's right. The hedges Not just about movement, but about what really is a unit. Mm -hmm. So if you okay, said- so I've tried to make it clear. Uh, where will I be going? The answer would be to the store. Now you could say, where will I be going to? And the answer would be the store, showing that there's a constituency within a constituency. But you wouldn't say, or I propose that it would be ungrammatical to say, where will I be going to the? Exactly. Right. An answer Although the in my house, that's how we do it, because I love to violate island constraints. <laughs> it all sounds good to me now. <laughs> right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about phrases and clauses. I have them all outlined in some example sentences in a few slides. So we'll talk about it when we talk about levels of transitivity. Okay, but bef before we can discuss levels of transitivity, uh, you must know what even transitivity is. So we're gonna have uh, transitivity at a glance and then we'll investigate it a little more with a little more depth as we go on. So first, it's important to state that the tr concept of transitivity in syntax is not the same as the concept from math. Uh, you can see a bit of metaphorical extension once you know how both work, uh, but it's not helpful to think about the mathematical concept of transitivity to try to learn about the syntactic uh, concept. Ban banish it from your mind. It is not welcome here, that concept. <laughs> right. I mean, if you already know it, do your best to forget, but if you don't, don't go learn it. Don't pause the, con the podcast to go learn it. They just um, share a label, that is all. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's they share they share a label. That's the best way to describe it. So transitivity, the way we're presenting it here, is a property of clauses, and the level of transitivity is determined by the number of core arguments in the clause. And in a second, I'm going to tell you what a core argument is and how you can tell how many are in the clause. But at a glance, why? is knowing about transitivity useful for language learning? Well, first of all, it's useful to understand systems of case, agreement, and word order in languages which have phenomena uh, that transitivity might affect those three things, um, which that is the case, by the way, that is the case for case. Uh, another phenomena <laughs> that you have to deal with in many languages is passivization. Mm -hmm. And passivization is a transitive transitivity reducing operation. So it's important to understand how transitivity works in order to spot passives and learn about them. Finally, um, verb morphology and or alternations. There are other things um, in languages which can operate around transitivity. We're gonna look at a little bit of this uh, in Korean towards the end of the episode. And finally, um, transitivity underpins the notion of subject and object. So every uh, language you study, spoken or signed, will have the notion of subject and object. And 
these notions can't exist without transitivity. Often, if you're taught what a subject is in high school, let's say, they often do not teach you about transitivity. Um, but you are presumably, normally, typically studying, studying your first language or a language you know very well in high school, even if it's your second language. Um, but what we've seen is people who study a second language, such as I studied a uh, second language in university, and there were some phenomena in that language which had to do with transitivity, but I never understood transitivity, so always struggled mm -hmm. um, with those phenomena. Yeah, a lot of learner errors come from not understanding transitivity. So yeah, it's so useful for language learning. I agree. Um, now we're just going to look quickly at the levels of transitivity. Transitivity may seem like a opaque uh, notion at first, but the reality is, uh, this is the way I like to teach syntax, as I say, there's basically three types of sentences, right? Sentences with one thing, sentences with two things, and sentences with three things. And everything else is just some sort of version of this. And I feel, particularly if you're studying languages that are lesser studied and do not have any descriptive or learning materials, this is a helpful thing to help you uh, get started. So how I have it here is my example sentences are the first sentence is intransitive. Now intransitive means there's one core argument. So right? what's a core argument? That I, right after I give these examples, I'm going to define core argument. Um, but for now, to understand what a core argument is, that's gonna be a type of noun phrase, right? A noun phrase that is not optional. Let's so say just a noun, a, a noun just, phrase that is essential to the sentence, but I'll so, give you some specific things, some specific details to bite into on the very next slide. And just as we said to banish the mathematical meaning of transitive from your mind, please don't think of a dispute between a disagreement between people. That's not that sense of argument that we mean here. We mean that's right. Thank you. Tom, oh, that's right. That's right. Thank you. This might mislead. When that's not even a salient sense of argument to me. Yeah. <laughs> when you talk to linguists all day, you just assume argument yeah. means like an essential noun mm -hmm. phrase in the sentence, right? Well, this is point, or, a salient yeah, noun yeah. phrase, right? Again, similar, just the same label for two different, probably not even related meanings. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's we're not talking about a disagreement. Argument is another term for um, noun phrases. I think that's going to be the easiest way to think about it. Okay, so uh, intransitive has one core argument, a transitive clause will have two core arguments, and a ditransitive clause will have three core arguments. Our example for an intransitive sentence is Liz laughs. We've got the noun phrase Liz and the verb laughs. There's a single core argument, Liz. For a two core argument clause, we are trying to use one of the words from our title. So we have Liz, eats the cake. Liz is a noun phrase that's a core argument and the cake is a noun phrase that's a core argument. So this clause is transitive as it has two core arguments. Finally, our ditransitive sentence is Liz gives Bill the cake, right? Um, Liz is a core argument, Bill is a core argument and the cake is a core argument. So since it has three core arguments, we label this uh, clause as ditransitive. Now, Tyler asks an important question, uh, which we'll have to deal with now, which is what's a core argument? Um, <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, our example sentence word is, Liz is often my example noun phrase. Um, and this may seem like an homage to the author, Eat, Bite, Kick. Oh, or, it does, huh? They love. Eat, eat, for love. <laughs> eat could, for yeah. Love. Uh, but um, the less this spiritual actually, predecessor. Uh, it just happens to be my sister's name. Uh, so I, I use my siblings in my example sentences. Sometimes I think that's fun. You can choose whatever names you like for your example sentences at home, um, but it's just coincidence. All right, so what's in a core argument? Now, once you get into language, language is a complex adaptive system and it's hard to discuss just one thing in isolation without discussing several other notions that scaffold and facilitate each notion. So we're going to have to discuss core arguments briefly, but probably we'll have to have another podcast dedicated to the notion of the core argument. So I'm going to present a very simple version here that will get us through our talk of transitivity. 
But if you are a professional syntactician out there, um, don't send us any hate mail because you feel like we didn't give enough time to core argument. We have some more thoughts. Hey, okay. Yeah. And feel free to come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, come on and make the case. Elbow your way on here. Yes. If you are a professional <laughs> syntactician that would like to argue about core arguments, <laughs> yes, at Peter at Lango. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So core arguments are not optional, but they can be pro dropped. So what does that mean? Um, there are many languages which allow you to leave one uh, argument, one core argument, one noun phrase out of the spoken sentence. Uh, I don't know if sign language does this as well, but I presumably there are sign varieties that do this as well. Um, for example, in the language I speak often, Portuguese, you may often leave the subject argument, the overt argument off of the utterance. You can say it without it because the verb agrees with the subject. And in a discourse, people have enough information that if you the verb agrees, for example, with third singular, they're gonna know which person you're talking about, right? Because of the context. This is similar with many other languages we teach at Lango, mm -hmm. such as Japanese, right? Where mm -hmm. you can leave off some core arguments if they're understood by the discourse. Even but without this, our agreement, it could just be dropped off. Right. Yeah, if, if yeah you might the, the Japanese, Korean don't have agreement, but you mm -hmm. can still do it. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in Portuguese and in Spanish, you can leave out the pronouns, but not in French. Yeah, that is interesting. I've heard that you can leave out arguments in Chinese sometimes, even though there's no verbal morphology at all. Absolutely. Yeah, so it, it really has to do typologically is more common with languages which have uh, participant agreement on the verbs. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's not as simple as being a pro drop that is a phenomena of merely having agreement and case marking and such. It is a lot more about what people understand in the whole conversation. What you know in the real world affects whether this will be dropped in the sentence or not. But that doesn't mean it's optional. Right. My view of option optionality here is that it's essential for the in correct interpretation of the sentence. Right. So it's not optional mm -hmm. if you if you, for example, in Japanese, if you leave the subject off of the sentence, if you don't say it, that doesn't mean that an object will get subject case marking. Right, Tyler? Sorry, which language did you say? Japanese. Japanese. Okay, so say it again. <laughs> if you leave off a, a subject argument in Japanese, right, but it's a transitive sentence, it does not mean that the object will get the subject case marking. It will still be marked. Right, yeah. An object. Mm -hmm. That'd be wild. What a concept. <laughs> Never That'd be an uh, interesting sentence. <laughs> It'd be very hard to understand, right? So this could work for certain types of verbs, such as like, the window broke and I broke the window. Oh, wait, I'm thinking about ergativity again. No, in a, in a, <laughs> so they both be marked absolutive in an ergative system. So you could get some ambiguity, but in a no, no world major language is ergative. Every language we teach at Lango so far is nominative. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about this little comment on ergativity, but uh, just to say there could be a context where this could be confusing, but that's like five podcasts from now. We'll discuss that. <laughs> Just to say that if, if something is omitted from the spoken sentence, but it's essential to the interpretation of the sentence, it's not really optional, right? Agreed. This is kind of the view we're putting here and our evidence is the case marking in a language like Japanese would still get the object case marker wo if the subject is omitted because everybody knows about it. Now in English, we're gonna look at some English today and I'm gonna give you a diagnostic for English. Uh, and maybe this is arguable. If you're a professional syntactician, please come on and debate this argument about arguments with us. So in English, a simple diagnostic would be that a core argument is never preceded by a preposition, right? So noun phrases we call NP in syntax are inside prepositional phrases, right? Um, so it must be a noun phrase without a preposition to be eligible to even be considered to be a core argument. Mm -hmm. So beyond English, their core arguments can be reflected in the morphosyntax by case marking and verbal agreement. So for example, with Japanese, we get this object agreement, 
or this object case marker, marker. Um, right? This is reflecting its core yeah. argument status, right? So if you're, we'll talk about this in a second when we get to verbs more. Uh, and maybe we're gonna have to talk more about case marking, morphosyntax and verbal agreement in a future podcast. Maybe we'll, once we get through the boot camp of syntax, <laughs> we'll talk about the architecture of language and the possibilities. We'll go to the next level, boot camp yeah. first. Yes. Uh, of course, that. our next our next slide is now again revisiting levels of transitivity, and I thought that's what Lisa meant when she said we're going to the next level. <laughs> right. Well, so we're going to revisit. It works. Let's go with it. <laughs> we're going to revisit our levels of transitivity. Um, if you recall, before I told you that a two two core arguments were in the um, utterance, the clause, Liz ate the cake, and so it's transitive, right? But I want to, you know, um, give some examples here of sentences that might look transitive, but according to our diagnostic with prepositions are not transitive. So the first one is uh, one core argument and one prepositional phrase. So uh, in this slide, we managed to incorporate more of our words in here. So the first one is Liz ate the cake. The next one is Liz prayed to the sky. So we've got eat and pray. We've put them in past tense and you'll see why when we get to the semantics of transitivity. So Liz prayed to the sky. It is preceded by a preposition, right? And I think that it is often okay. Uh, I think uh, I think it's okay to say things like a verb like pray uh, in the sense of eat, pray, love. Mm -hmm. There's not necessarily an object, more maybe a destination, pray to a deity or to mm -hmm. an object or something. Um, but again, destinations are less likely to be core arguments because they're preceded by prepositions or they're preceded by prepositions because they're less likely to be core arguments. So that's kind of a chicken and egg analysis there. But the point is, under our system here, Liz prayed to the sky is intransitive because the only core argument is Liz. This would be the same as Liz walked to the store. Mm -hmm. To the store is, we would call that an adjunct. Mm -hmm. um, an adjunct in syntax means it's a way of being clear that it's not core. Right. Not essential. It's not essential, right? The sentence, the meaning can mostly be recovered without it. In a sentence, we have a, our next example. Um, we managed to use our third verb here for eat, pray, love. We have one core argument and one prepositional phrase again. And the sentence is, the cake was loved by Liz. <laughs> now it's fine to say the cake was loved, right? A uh, little bit of oddness there maybe. It's a little bit of oddness, but um, let's imagine that cake loving was a crime and something <laughs> Congress did it. Now you'd automatically say the cake was loved, right? Or if it's just all gone and you, you know, it's rip to the cake. It was loved. <laughs> I just, I was uh, kind of silly because I, <laughs> very often in political speech, when the politicians do something bad, it was pa it's a passive sentence. Mm. Like, well- Mistakes were made. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. A, bi a bill that ruins life for all of us was passed. No, yeah. no, this Focus on the verb you know, and away from who did it, right? We don't know how this happened. It was bad. <laughs> no, you politicians got together and agreed to pass the bill. So <laughs> always people do this when they want to remove themselves from responsibility. I particularly think like insurance adjusters and things like this. Like if you're from, if you're trying to avoid getting in trouble, you're going to be like, a wreck was had <laughs> or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it was. I like that mistakes were made, not I made a mistake or we made mistakes, right? So it does change the meaning of the sentence, I would say, but that's the point of the passive is to shift. Now, it's not just, if you're a professional syntactician, again, come and debate with us. It's a shift of focus, right? But it goes beyond this. There are other ways to shift focus. For example, I could say the cake Liz loved, right? That's a way to, but it's still transitive but the cake was loved by Liv, it's a full-on syntactic shift to an intransitive uh, sentence from a transitive sentence. You could imagine Liz ate the cake, was transformed into the cake was loved by Liz, or the cake was eaten by Liz, right? If that was really the passive. 
Um, and that is part of the reason, part of the inspiration for the term transformational grammar is when people propose that these sorts of passives, for example, are transformations of a basic sentence. This is not necessarily in the modern consensus uh, in theoretical syntax, but it does help you understand the connection between passives and basic transitive sentences. Okay, now- Do we have a time to just share our great passive sentence with Peter, <laughs> with your name in it? Yes, share it. What was it? A prickly peck of passives <laughs> was picked by Tim Peter. Yeah, I feel like we need Tyler on this one because it was something like a, a pack of peckled pip. If pip I can't say it, but there's isn't a, a peck the is it is that the measure word measure word for a, a for pickle, pickle for pickles for pickles. Okay, so a peck of pickled passives was pecked by <laughs> Peter. Did right. you, Peter? <laughs> I wouldn't say I did it, but I would say that a peck of passives was pecked. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting close here. That that tongue twister is still a challenge, even uh, in its modified version. Mm -hmm. So thus far, we have more or less presented transitivity. Uh, say tongue, you could say tongues were twisted. Tongues were <laughs> twisted. <laughs> that is uh, going to be probably in my evaluation as a teacher. So tongues were twisted, right? <laughs> so, um, we have thus far presented to you transparently as transitivity as properties of clauses, but we've also conflated and said, oh, these verbs are gonna be more transitive than others. So Speaking what is, egg, yeah. yeah, is transitivity a property of verbs or a property of clauses? Well, <laughs> this is the controversy. Uh, Dixon and Eichenwald, uh, a pair of famous linguists, uh, they support the notion that transitivity is a property of verbs, right? And you can see why it works because we already discussed like kind of the semantics of the verb will let you know if there's, if I say something like kick, you really have a notion in your mind that something was kicked, right? There's something- I don't know, I, I picture like, what do you call it? a performance number, a big number on a stage with is just dancers kicking in the air. And it's not necessary that something is. Ah, being you did kicked. a tricky one there where you like said the kicking rockets. in the air instead of mm. kicking the air. I saw you there. <laughs> <laughs> but you could say they kicked the air. <laughs> you could say they kicked the air. Yeah, sure. I could say I kicked my feet, like in the water. So there, there's, hmm. I feel that it's pretty high in transitivity as long as there's something affected, but. We're going to talk about semantics of transitivity soon, but Tyler already pointed out, and I, I don't know if this was the intent of it, but it feels like air is less affected than a human. So it feels like it's going to, and sure enough, when it we have the semantics that it's less transitive, suddenly then you can get it in a prepositional phrase, I kicked mm -hmm. in the air. That's an acceptable grammatical sentence to me, right? But then the problem is, is kick transitive or not? It's about the clause. It actually perfectly demonstrates the point. If you have kicked in the air, it's not transitive, but kicked the air is transitive. Those things don't mean the same thing to me either. Not exactly. Mm -hmm. So if I kicked in the air, it isn't as though as the air is affected, but if I kicked the air, it may seem pointless, like what we know pragmatically about the world, but it seems like that was what my intention was. Right. Uh, so you can also, yes. Are you doing, are you... Are there some gems of nuggets of wisdom in the chat box? Because I can't see them. Do you want to bring them on yeah. there? Uh, Tyler just dropped us a chat here of kicked in the air versus kicked and my teeth. No, no, not and, in, kicked in. Different, oh, kicked in. different kicked structures in. here. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. right, yeah, yes. Kicked in can be a phrasal verb, like kicked in the door. Exactly. The door is nicer, yeah. Less so to think of. I didn't really address this in this podcast, but I'm glad it came up. Phrasal verbs are going to be a problem mm -hmm. for you. If and let's let's define that real quickly. So to my mind, as an English teacher, those are the cases where two or more, I suppose, words have to be have to all be present for a, a meaning to arise, such as kick the bucket. Speaking of kick mm -hmm. means, well, that's maybe it's an idiom. I don't know it's really a, fra a phrasal verb, but look up. Mm -hmm. Look up something in the dictionary. Just saying look doesn't get you that meaning. You have to have both the up and the look present. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there can move around. And I think this might have even been in our chunks test for um, the last podcast with I ran up the bill and I ran mm. up the hill. 
where you can say up the hill is where I ran, but you can't say up the bill is where I ran because ran up it. and ran up the bill is a <laughs> phrasal verb. So we have this, when it's a preposition in a phrasal verb, it's not actually a preposition anymore. That's my mm -hmm. argument. It just looks like one. It has, it's homophonous, mm -hmm. but the particle and the verb are a, a new thing. Um, and it's actually what we're calling it phrasal verbs. They're pretty rare cross linguistically. So it's right. a huge thing that must be taught to second language speakers of English. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, it's the least taught thing in ESL pedagogy. But you're yeah, gonna, that's a good point. Yeah, often gonna, a part of idioms too. It's really important. Idioms to are total, totally even harder and every language is full of them. But phrasal verbs particularly is something that doesn't happen in most languages. So it's gonna be harder to figure out how it works. Uh, and it's not taught so much in ESL pedagogy, but as soon as you hit the streets in America, for example, you're gonna, people are gonna say them nonstop and you're gonna have to figure out what it means, right? So uh, we gave the example here of an ambivalent word eat or an anti-causative break and even um, kick worked this way, that there are verbs that ambivalent we're going to talk or, about valence in a second. Or we, or we might say ambivalent. Do you hear that too? For people new to the word or less familiar with it. it is, that, is that the same spelling as ambivalent? Absolutely. Yeah, meaning it means having two values or having both values is the breakdown of this ambivalent, ambivalent. I've used ambivalent a lot in my writing and never used ambivalent. So I never actually knew those were... <laughs> Call them doublets. We got, uh, Another nice pair on this on the topic of doubles is homage and homage. Some prototypes here. Um, now we haven't they're covered not interchangeable, but valency stolen. either, Peter. So We're maybe. about to cover valency. About uh, to. That's why I was going to mention ambivalent. We're ascribing the value of having one or two core arguments associated with it to the verb by using this mechanism called valence. So it's very similar to transitivity, but it's specifically the properties of the verb and then how they interact with transitivity. So a verb like eat um, could have an object such as Liz eats the cake. Mm -hmm. It's also acceptable though for it to not have an object such as Liz eats. Or like, did Liz eat breakfast? Liz ate. Well, then you might say it's ellipsis. Did Liz already eat? Liz ate, right? So in these contexts, you can use eat with only one core argument. So then we have to say, well, there's two types of transitivity to the verb. No, we will say, well, that's a verb that could take two things, but the clause itself is what we analyze for transitivity, which is supported by many linguists. So uh, we have a small list here of Hopper and Thompson, 1980, the seminal paper that we're going to look at some of their semantic components of transitivity, where they pr propose this kind of stuff. Lazard, 2003, and Nass, 2007. Shout out to my uh, one of my former teachers, Osil Nass. And there's been much, much, much more work proposing that transitivity is a property of clauses. I just put three papers I thought were salient, um, not just because it's my teacher. Many people would agree that that's the same. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I don't know. If you're a professional linguist, the, um, the invitation's open. Come debate with us. Right, but so, this is important to point out to um, this gray area and a lot of linguistic theory, right? Um, in general, right? Binary theories are useful in understanding something as complex as language, but a lot of times they, there's gray area. That's, that's right. Um, literally, the next slide is dedicated to non-binary transitivity. Let's um, go there. Yeah, I think we've already covered basically verbal properties can be described with valence, right? So uh, there are some uh, nuances to transitivity here. And one of them is that transitivity uh, is often proposed to be non-binary. Binary means polar or yes and no, often represented uh, with ones and zeros in computer programming. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, I think, what often what people think of when they think of binary. Yeah, ones and zeros is good. North, south, if you think of a, a magnet, just a regular iron magnet that you play with in elementary school, um, there's not going to be a third pole, and you can't have a magnetized object with just one. It's always the two, nothing else. That's um, true binary. Mm. Uh, a light switch is a good way to think about this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there probably is a... If but you, not a dimmer. Cast those from your mind. <laughs> but not a dimmer. Actually, transitivity will come back to the dimmer. Okay. Yes, not a dimmer. A light switch, something that can yes be... Yes or no. 
on off. Perhaps if you had uh, a extremely sensitive video camera that could see things in extremely tiny, small, you would see actually the phase where it's not quite on or off. But for human perception, the light switch seems to be either on or either off, right? But I pointed out that maybe there's a way to see it as not because many things that are binary at a distance have non-binary attributes to them extremely mm -hmm. up close. And transitivity is no different. We're uh, today explaining transitivity as a binary phenomenon because I, I feel that it gets you so much. It explains so much in any given language that you're going to have a hard time getting started till you understand how the binary transitivity works in the language. But sure enough, <laughs> in almost any language, when you study it enough, you'll find aspects of the transitivity that are not binary. So Hopper and Thompson's seminal paper was called Transitivity and Grammar and Discourse. And they and many others have acknowledged transitivity gray areas, right? Um, Hopper and Thompson propose a series of semantic components, which they correlate with high and low transitivity. Instead of transitivity being one, two, and three, as I presented as either eutransitive or intransitive, let's say, um, there are things that are more transitive, things that are less transitive, right? And we kind of showed it with uh, a little bit with the verbs we looked at, but we're looking at more. Um, within a single language, there are often ambiguous contexts. Uh, and indeed, cross-linguistically, there's even bigger ones. So one that I've noticed myself to have quite a bit of variation is reflexive action. Reflexive means, in my case, it would be something I do against myself. But if I say, um, uh, she helped herself, for example, that would also be one doing it against oneself. That's reflexive. Now in English, we, I th right? I think we treat reflexive action as Transitive since yes, uh, help might not be the clearest example, but yeah, I, help is again a less transitive one. I didn't know I what I, didn't want to say. I saw myself, I find myself. Yes, I, I what did you say, Lisa? Bathe myself. Bathe, oh, okay. I Lisa has been taking care of a baby, and I thought you said, like, oh, I peed myself, and I said, well, I just, you know, <laughs> there's another one, but um, bathe is another baby thing. Um, <laughs> That's, that's something she actually, would say. Yes. Actually, be, let's uh, pause. A, let's pause a moment on P myself. I think that's <laughs> okay. the, the only direct object you could get with that. Really, you couldn't pee someone else, could you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is funny to say like, "Oh, I peed your pants," or you know, I, you I peed, peed yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That one's uh, yeah. You, you can only do it to yourself, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you learn about uh, prepositional phrases. <laughs> which more data called, needed more research mm -hmm. which are called pps in <laughs> syntax and so you can pp yourself yeah you can you could literally if you PP said i look in myself then you would have pp'd yourself <laughs> because you put a prepositional phrase in i looked in myself <laughs> i don't know that's pretty bad the point here is <laughs> when the whole room is quiet the jokes are done it's not funny anymore <laughs> All right, so the point is reflexive action is transitive in some languages. <laughs> For example, <laughs> um, Tyler pointed out one that if it's not reflexive, it changes meaning, but we're gonna leave that spicy one from the mm -hmm. chat for people who actually email us and ask. So um, in English and a language that I have also <laughs> called Sasak from the island of Lombok, in Indonesia, uh, the reflexive action works transitively, but Sasak is an Austronesian language related to Roviana, another mm -hmm. Austronesian language from Solomon Islands. And in Roviana, intransitive action has non-binary, or uh, reflexive action has non-binary transitivity. There can only be, again, it's an ergative absolute of language, so it's gonna be more opaque, whether it's an object or an intransitive subject, there can only be one thing. They don't have a reflexive pronoun. They use a serial verb construction and object agreement and such. And it's it's it looks kind of transitive, but it also doesn't look transitive. And you definitely can't get reflexive binding if you're a genitive syntax petition. That's what you're wondering about. And oh. there's other languages which don't have reflexive pronouns or express reflexive action in a non-transitive way. Mm. Um, but that's something for the typologist. If you're extremely curious, please uh, book a lesson in transitivity. Okay, 
we want to talk a little bit about the semantic components of transitivity. Uh, I'm CFing here, Hopper and Thompson, 1980, but this is, doesn't go exactly like their paper does. It's kind of a summary of the, bi the big ones, although if you read the paper, you'll see exactly why I put it this way. Okay, so uh, our first semantic component in transitivity is participants. Now, this is actually very similar to the last one, but uh, some linguists argue they're different, so we're going to introduce many words. You decide how many you think are useful. Participants is simply that two are required for transitive constructions. This is basically the definition of transitivity syntactically. So this isn't entirely different um, than the syntactic definition, but you can it already explains things like why is reflexive action not transitive in some languages because there's not two participants. <laughs> so that that actually is pretty useful, even though we'll see it's overlapping with some of the other semantic features. So that's probably why it's first. The next one is kinesis, right? Think of kinesiology. Kinesis uh, is- Kinetic also is the adjective, has to do with movement. Mm -hmm. Right, has to do with movement. So actions are more transitive than states. What's a state, for example? So a state, um, I want to say a state of being. State that of being is what came to Well, okay, so, so no to people. me is a state of verb. I know it. Mm -hmm. Persist through time, whereas forget, I don't know if it's really an action per se with a lot of dynamism in it, mm -hmm. but forget mm -hmm. is more punctual. No I is got it. no is a interesting state of verb though, because it often takes a compliment. Mm -hmm. And the compliment so, like um the compliment can be its own clause. Like I will know. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. The object is often sub the sub uh, component is often the sentence itself. You can say like I know that it's gonna rain. You'll like Star Wars or whatever, and then you, that even though that's past tense inside a present tense. So yeah. But let's. Uh, how can we make this one clear with a nice example to contrast just an action with a state here for our purposes? Right. With so I have an example, okay. and um, so for example, uh, fear is often I'm afraid. That's a state. Right, so in Austronesian often states, at least his, historically were marked with a prefix ma, particularly in Oceanic languages. So these are incorporated into stative verbs sometimes in Oceanic languages. So like fear coming from takut originally is now matakut in Oceanic, uh, matagutu in Roviana, and it is a state of fear. Mm -hmm. um, I think emotions are often states. So like I'm sad. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, oh, Emotions, excellent. Tyler's pointed out the, the difference between frighten and fear. So, um, mm -hmm. but this is, this is again, more about um, this actually is you fear can be transitive in English, for example. Yeah, I fear it's, change. It's <laughs> fear and scare, you might say, or frighten uh, are kind of on Frighten is more transitive and scare is more transitive. And I'll, I'll just give you the examples right now. For example, I don't know if this is an unfortunate time. This is the actual examples I memorized from syntax class where I fear the police and the police frighten me, right? So I fear the police or I fear the boogeyman or whatever you want to put there. Whereas like uh, the stimulus is the syntactic object and the experiencer, me, the one feeling the fear is the subject, but I'm afraid Right. Now you might say, um, I'm afraid to go, but you wouldn't say I'm afraid going, right? You, you have to get this infinitive or something. Uh, so fear states generally work a little weirder. Um, that's exactly the point. Actions are going to be more transitive, right? If you have a split, don't be surprised if states work differently. State of words, verbs typically work differently. Like if you're going to get a weird mm -hmm a weird one-off intransitive. There's often a lot more variation in intransitives cross-linguistically than people think. And one of the things you might get if you're studying a lesser studied language is a whole class of stative intransitive verbs that just work differently than other intransitive verbs. Um, this can even be codified all the way down to participant marking, but that is a future podcast where we talk about active stative marking. We'll see some kinesis here in uh, Japanese and Korean too. It's one of the reasons we picked eat, this eat, particular component. eat and bite 
because they're <laughs> high in kinesis. Okay. So aspect. Now aspect is describes. It's separate from tense. If you've heard of tense, as in past tense, you're you've got you've got a, your first window into aspect. Now, if you said progressive, right, you could have past progressive. I was going. Now, this going is the aspect. It's a little less um, formal than tense. Although I think in a lot of Indo-European languages, they're treated somewhat similarly. So I know that in Portuguese, for example, you conjugate verbs for both tense and aspect typically. All right, but just to say aspect, a completed action is more transitive than an ongoing one, right? So um, what's a good example of this? It was forgotten by me versus it was, it was known by me. I was just gonna say forget and know, I think is a good example of it again. Like forgot is completen. complete. Complete. <laughs> I'm struggling to go. No, did I you like say that. completement? What was it? I thought you said completen. I just did Which the, is great. I did the irregular um, perfect. Like <laughs> All right. Well, uh, more on that later. I love okay, that. So, okay. <laughs> okay. The next one we want to look at is punctuality. And a punctual event is punctual events, that is, are more transitive than non-punctual events typically so a punctual event for example is a kick you kick boom it's not like that's it it happened it, it only takes a, a fraction of a second and and not you can't do a single kick for five hours that didn't work you could kick repeatedly <laughs> yes you can, right. you can kick that could take as long as you like but a single kick is punctual that's what we're saying right so punk, for a anybody point. who is uh, newer to english punctual when we describe it, a person is punctual, we typically mean they show up to things on time. <laughs> right on time. Mm -hmm. Right on time. Right and again, at the time. The, the rule for I, linguistic terminology is, is it has to be an everyday word just meaning something. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. But that's our job is to get, <laughs> is to break it down. Make What's it more worse sticky. is that within linguistics, we use the same term at like all the different subfields with different meanings. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So has, yeah, yeah. Wait, so maybe maybe it's a good time to touch on the etymology, the the, the connection, why these words all look alike. The root mm -hmm. of it, this punctum, is the source of the word point. The basic metaphor is a point as opposed to like a line, a continuum, or something. That's the common meaning. And punctual nice. regarding time is <laughs> you show up on the dot. Mm -hmm. Carry is a perfect example of a non-punctual uh, verb because it kind of it lasts a duration of time. Mm -hmm. Picking up is punctual, but then carrying it, it has to take some time. Mm -hmm. You can't really carry something for half a second. That's right. A bit odd. So in fact, like, um, well, I don't want to get too dark here, but we, if we compared be sick versus die versus kill, you see the transitivity go up with each one. Be sick mm -hmm. is non-punctual. It is a state. Die is punctual, um, but there's not two participants, and it's pretty low in kinesis, though it is punctual. So die tends to be intransitive. What else could it be? But kill is always transitive, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So those are nice. Uh, I guess you could mean. I think that comics can say like, "Oh, how was your set last night? I killed." But I think that that's an idiomatic object drop or something, but mm. either way, it's a different use than what we mean when we're yeah, saying. Yeah, it's, that's right. It's a new verb being derived, that's derived from an old, an old more familiar one. Mm -hmm. That Same one, dead. I killed last night. Don't think, I don't think you could pacify that, pacifize that. The audience was killed by me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yes. Then you I could do slayed it. though, and that's a similar bit. Yeah. That's interesting because I would, I don't know, the, the pedant in me would want it to be slew. That's, the, that's, the I right. slew. <laughs> that's what makes you a great language teacher though tyler so we <laughs> authenticity <laughs> our last condition on this slide is volitionality so you can think that if you do something of your own volition it means that you wanted to you are not coerced to do it someone didn't make you do it you wanted to do it right so intentional action tends to affect patients more than unintentional action. So um, 
for example, consider this. Trip is often uh, transitive, can be. You could say I tripped, but you're saying I tripped myself or I tripped on something. But you could say something like Bill tripped Liz or Liz tripped Bill. I'll make Liz the agent in this one. Liz tripped Bill. This is high volitionality. It's intentional. It affects a patient more. But Bill slipped. Right? Liz can't slip bill, unless you mean like slipped money or something, but a different use of slip, not slip and fall, right? Mm -hmm. Fall and slip are extremely unintentional. So they're low in volitionality. Whereas kick is high in volitionality, right? So these are things to think about as you study different languages and think about how their transitivity might not match up exactly with your uh, first language. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple more semantic components of transitivity. The first one on this slide is affirmation. Uh, and this one is probably my least favorite of the, of the features, but I feel like once in a while it is useful still. And that is affirmative statements are more transitive than negative ones. And this one is trickier to come up with examples for in English. Um, but it just seems to be doing stuff is more transitive than not doing stuff, I guess. So <laughs> what did you do? Nothing. Nothing was done by me. Yeah, it works. My, my favorite go-to test is, as you can tell, passivizing. Passivizing, yeah. But hmm. there's others. That's not the only criterion. Yeah, this one is uh, one I included uh, because I, I kind of thought that you might see it come up sometimes. And also negation doesn't work the same in every language, so... Yeah, actually, this is Certainly nice true. for some examples of Korean and probably Japanese, right? There's um, some of the intransitive verbs. You can't do the affirmative statement. Does that make sense? I'm thinking That's of need. You can't have the need, but you can That's do right. not have. Yeah, so maybe there's a parallel, though, with this one, with F. Something yes, interesting. I I, I'm thinking about it. I just don't want to uh, say what I think, you know, here in Korean, some questions I have without without being so sure. But we'll look at it a little bit with the Korean verbs, and I think you'll see a little bit um, how this might work. Let's I have a, 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 an idea. All right, so the next one we're going to talk about is mode. And modality isn't the... All languages can express modality, first of all, but in some languages, it's much more coded than in others. But essentially what I mean when I'm talking about mode as a semantic component of transitivity is that an action which occurs in the real world is more transitive than one that does not. So something that really happened is more transitive than a hypothetical. This doesn't play out that much in English, but you could imagine why it might play out differently in languages which are really um, serious about marking this there are languages which matter a lot. If, for example, Dan Everett claims of Piraha that uh, basically like you can only talk about things that you've seen or someone else has seen and so on and so forth. And you have to have these evidentials of how you know this event happened and it becomes, or else it's just well, totally hypothetical. I think it's a little, I don't, I, it's not that you can't talk about unreal things, but you, you're, you're just marking in every utterance, you're marking how confident you are of the things that you assert, whether you saw it yourself or you got it from a reliable source. You can still talk about things you haven't witnessed. Right. So th he gives the idea that he's trying, he's there as a missionary originally. He's trying to explain to them something about Christianity. Not quite a missionary, but something along that. He was there to prepare a Bible translation and not to be a missionary himself, actually. It's funny because he claims to be a missionary all the time. He talks about it a lot, his missionary days, and refers to himself as a missionary quite a bit. Not now. He's an ex-missionary, but he... I mean, mm -hmm, he yeah. Social media. He posts about quite a bit. his ex. Regardless of the specifics of what he's doing, the example that's important to the listener is... And if you don't know who Dan Everett is, uh, check out this book, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. I thought it's very interesting, very inspirational. Um, the Piraha language in general, yeah, very fascinating and questions, you know, a lot of linguistic theory what we know certainly importantly highlights the need of academic linguistics to study the the range of the world's languages mm -hmm. instead of just focusing on you know the five percent that are the most spoken the and, western varieties yeah 
Yeah. So what happens is just to say, uh, Dan Everett, this is my understanding, is trying to explain to them something about uh, Jesus from the Bible. And they say, does Jesus look like you or does he look like us? He says, well, I haven't seen Jesus. And they're like, wait, but you just said all this stuff was true and you haven't seen and it. Like, and they, what did your like, dad say he looked like? Yeah, what did your dad say he looked like? And he's like, well, my dad didn't see him either. And, and they become really mm -hmm. incredulous. Why are you telling us about him then? Yeah, why, mm -hmm. become, yeah you're just talking about non-real world things. There's hypothetical things. But they have it very coded in their language, so it matters a lot. And I don't know how this interacts with transitivity in that language. Um, because the languages that I have focused on in my study of language haven't uh, haven't had much phenomena focused around mode, but there are languages where it's just central to the grammar. So then in those languages, you're gonna see more variation in transitivity. The next one, and this should be pretty much the most vanilla, most predicted transitive <laughs> component is agency. Participants high in agency can affect more transfer of action than those low in agency, right? So uh, in some languages, for example, they'll have a hierarchy of agency such that um, this will affect all sorts of things, whether there's even participant marking at all, because it's assumed, for example, if you said um, in a language that was uh, had a lot of this kind of agency hierarchy in action, one thing might be that you would say, well, um, the man killed the tree, I guess you could say. Is that, you might be able to say that, right? Let's say you could. It's logically possible. It seems yes. odd because it's not an animal, but plants are just as alive as we are. Oh, how about, uh, yes, but, but I'm just trying to do an extreme example. You could do like the man killed the chicken or something, and then you get the chicken killed the man. It's less likely, but still possible. And in the tree, it's extremely less likely. In some, some languages, there's a bigger split between plants and moving things in any language pretty much that has agency hierarchy stuff. So you can imagine that a tree killing a, a human is so much less likely, but certainly also can happen, right? A tree has less agency, but it could fall. I could be chopping down the tree and accidentally kill someone else. So the tree killed, you know, you could see how this kind of extension could work, but then you'd need to mark that with an animacy surprise and such. And it might even be that it has to be oblique or something like this. So what they're saying is participants high in agency can affect more transfer of action than those low in agency. This is one of the properties of noun phrases that contributes to transitivity, not the properties of the verbs that contribute to transitivity. And in fact, our idea that participants need to be different, um, volitionality affects it. And we're gonna see uh, two more We've got three or four or five that are really about noun phrases. And that's how you're going to start. Yes, there's an interaction between verbs and noun phrases. Nothing, it's hard to really draw clean lines between these things. This is part of the reason we think it's more of a um, transitivity. It's more a feature of more a... Um, it has to do with clauses, not verbs, not a feature, let's say. Okay, so... Moving on to effectiveness, events in which the patient is more affected are more transitive. Right. This is just the other side of agency. High agency subjects going to transfer more action. Things that are more affected are going to be more transitive. Right. Um, well, okay. well, the thing that is affected is the object, whereas the thing that is transitive is the verb, clause. the verbal action. So let's the not clause. confuse our reference there. That's right. More affected. A clause is more likely to be transitive when the patient is more effective. By the way, an agent and patient are thematic roles mm -hmm. that we use in grammar. And an agent and patient are typically roles we use to describe core arguments, although it could be a non-core argument. <laughs> Two more terms that are very different. Well, we never brought it up. I just always assume people know what I mean when I say agent and patient. Mm -hmm. So our last semantic component here is individuation. That is events in which the patient is more distinct from the agent or more transitive. This to me is pretty similar to the participants um, semantic component, but it's important because now you immediately get why reflexive action again would be less transitive in some, right? Um, but think about this. Uh, in Roviana, if you were to say, I hurt myself or I cut myself, say on accident, I cut myself, you're gonna get this weird nebulous non-binary transitivity. But if you said, I cut my hand, you could get more transitivity. Mm -hmm. Even saying my hand, 
is more distinct, even though it's still the same participant, from just saying myself. Interesting point. So why do language learners care? <laughs> <laughs> That's the title of the next slide and the big money question. Well, there's syntactic operations that interact with transitivity, such as passive, incorporation, and questioning, particularly WH inversion in English and WH extraction asymmetries cross-linguistically, which we won't have time to do the cross-linguistic stuff, but another day we will. There's also transitivity calculus in many languages, uh, and I'm using this to describe the systems of case, verb agreement, and word order. Also, importantly, the notion of subject and object rely on transitivity. You cannot have an object without a notion of transitivity. So let's look again quickly at our levels of transitivity so that we can look at um, incorporation and passives, which I just mentioned, right? Incorporate, so our transitive sentence here is, Liz hunted the unicorn. And should right? this be bracketed too? Yeah, uh, we, unicorn. the rest of them have brackets. Uh, if you don't mind to live annotate that, Tyler. No problem. I just left the brackets off the first example. Right, so Liz is a core argument and the unicorn is a core argument. Now we can incorporate the object into the verb, right? This is what we call noun incorporation in uh, linguistics and it reduces the transitivity of the clause. So our next sentence is an incorporated version of the previous one, which is Liz went unicorn hunting. Now this has one core argument, Liz. Unicorn hunting is a compound, right? Or it's, yeah, I, I would say it's probably a compound. Headed in that direction, yeah. Yeah, it's certainly incorporated now, even if the full sound changes aren't there yet. And I just made it up. Unicorn hunting is not an idiom. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, can, you can do it for a long time, but not successfully. Yeah, so so like I I, I tried to not pick Something incorporations that, actually... that would be so idiomatic, it'd be hard, hard for us to know. So... Um, Oh, like head hunting or job hunting or something? Yeah, things like this. So uh, because Liz went unicorn hunting as one core argument, it's intransitive, even though there's notionally two things. Although notice that it's not punctual, right? You know, like it's easier to do this incorporation when it's not punctual. There's no idea if she actually got a unicorn, etc. Now our mm -hmm. next example is a passive. So you have one core argument but it's going to be the patient, not the agent this time. So we get the unicorn was hunted by Liz. By Liz is now optional. And you can just say the unicorn was hunted. All of these are intransitive versions of Liz hunted the unicorn. So you can see that your knowledge of transitivity will affect your ability to effectively use English. Mm -hmm. um, although maybe you can- And understand that. it. Yeah, yeah, definitely the understanding it that's going to be probably the bigger hurdle. If you just say only transitive sentences, you'll be fine. Everybody will know what you mean, but um, you're going to want to have access to passivization and incorporation to understand English. So the next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the WH questions, and we'll just look at them uh, really quickly. Uh, we're missing Tyler to remove our annotations. Let me see if I can help out here. Nope. All right. Annotate. Clear Got it. All. Oh, okay, excellent. Okay, so our basic sentence here is Liz baked the cake. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have a WH subject, Liz, we'll ask who baked. So it'd be who baked the cake. Now you might say that who doesn't involve any movement. It's not super relevant for this podcast, but just in case I'm going to put it inside a clause. Who do you think baked the cake? You do not get, do you think who baked the cake? You get, who do you think baked the cake? So it really is movement. Not that important because this is the easy one to know. The next one though, is the one that's trickier for language learners. What did Liz bake, right? What do you think Liz baked? So you must move this what. The basic sentence should be mm -hmm. Liz baked what, right? Liz baked what? But this what in English, we want, if we can, to move them to the front of the sentence because it's very important information. You want to know it first that we're asking a question. So you're paying attention. Uh, and in English, you got to have a do verb after mm -hmm. the WH if you move the object. So, and then this do verb is going to get your tense too. So it gets, um, that's why I also have, who do you think, what do you think Liz baked? To so show that the tense is assigned from the bake and do is there is present tense in the main clause. So what did Liz bake? At the very minimum, you have to know it's transitive so you can know 
Well, you may not know that it's transitive. You may be taught another way, but it is transitive. That's why you get the do support because this only happens when objects are fronted, not when subjects are fronted in English. So that's a quick look at how these interact in uh, English. Uh, I thought I'd show you quickly object agreement in Roviana. Yeah, let's get yeah, yeah. because stick here, comparatively speaking. You might not know. Um, Tyler, would you? Oh, we, we were gonna have to look at that in a second. So I'm gonna have Tyler annotate something for us in a second, or maybe it'll. Yeah. Absolutive is a proclitic, or it's going with the following word, right? Uh, right. So the I'll, I'll explain okay. it in a second. Yes, but it does go with it. Yeah. So, um, and you don't get it for ergative. They don't get any case marking or any particle before it or any article before it. So that's the case marking in Roviana for ergative is null marking. You remove stuff. Hmm. So the first sentence we have here is elevose sierra, elevose sierra. Uh, and if you're a first language speaker of Roviana and you want to correct my pronunciation, I beg you, contact me, help me. <laughs> Okay, so, and please come on our podcast. Now, Ele Vose Si Arau is I paddled in Roviano. Ele is the perfect marker. Paddle is Vose. It's kind of nice that those two words sound like uh, Portuguese pronouns. They do. They do. Uh, yes, there's several. Especially different... when you say them, maybe. <laughs> it's worse when I say it. I already speak Portuguese before I spoke Roviana, so it was, it's worse when I say it. Now, we won't tell you what an absolutive marker is today but just know it's kind of a thing that goes with nouns in certain contexts in a, an ergative absolutive language. You can call it a case marker, right? So you might be familiar with accusative dative markers. This is just it's, a different case system. It's a different kind of case system, right? So um, this sentence is intransitive. I is the only core argument in I paddled. And paddle, and, this, this, is this word a noun as well as a verb in Roviana? Or can this only be a verb here? This will say... I guess that's a question for a native speaker. Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm thinking I that's a it's a I want to say yes, but I also know there's a lot of very specific paddle terminology. So that makes me want to double check that and say all right, all right. each this paddle, comes each from uh, your dissertation work, by the way, the, from PS1. Yes, <laughs> that's so what that refers to. PS1-054, where I got <laughs> these sentences. Uh, and that's because there's a Roviana language archive on Kaipu Leahone hosted by University of Hawaii. Hawaii, uh, which is where I deposited the data I collected to write my dissertation. And I wrote my dissertation on Roviana. So that's why we're talking about it, because I know about it. Now, in the third singular, or in the next sentence, there's a third singular object. I paddled the canoe. The canoe is the object. And the sentence is, ele voce ia arau sahore. And sahore is, means like the canoe. That is a full noun phrase, and it's indexed by ia on the verb. Now, it's rare for a language to use object agreement without subject agreement. Object agreement with subject agreement is not particularly common, but object agreement without subject agreement is so uncommon, many people who are linguists who are listening won't believe that this is really an object alternation. So for the very next slide, I also have similar sentences, similar transitive sentences, where you can see that the object clitic, which attaches to the verb. Um, and it's, some people think that a clitic can't be an object marker, but this is not the thing called clitic doubling, right? This is not a pronominal clitic. It's not, this is a mandatory thing that must be in every transitive sentence. I analyze it as a clitic for phonological reasons, um, which are, it's a slim reason too. All right, so you have, he kicked me, taka au sa si rao. Now, or that could be si arau. There's a little variation there. So taka au means kick, and au is first singular, me. You can see Oh, nice how it rhymes there. Taka right. au, si arau, sa si rao. Yeah. Right? So you get a different marker. And then you, if just because so, we're trying to stick with the kick theme, I kick you is taka igu rao si goi. Now, you wouldn't be surprised in Roviana to learn. You wouldn't be surprised to learn that in Roviana, if you uh, index the object on the verb, which you must in every transitive sentence, and it's known, particularly if it's a pronoun, the third singular is going to be your most expressed noun phrase object because it could be something like a canoe or a person. But when it's second singular, it can only be you. So it's common to say something like taka instead of taka 
Rouse Sigoy. You don't necessarily always say it. But I've typed everything out so that everybody can know. Now that you've seen how transitive sentences work in Roviana, and you've seen the original one that was intransitive, we're going to look at a passive sentence in Roviana so you can see that the object agreement disappears. And you must understand transitivity to understand why that's happening. And because Roviana is a verb initial sentence, right? So our verb initial language typically, mo most sentences are verb initial, that it's harder to see, right? In English, in a passive, the object and subject appear to switch places, or the object is now a subject, right? And the former agent is now after the verb. But it doesn't look that way necessarily in Roviana. So you got to pay attention to the morphology. You got to know about transitivity. The sentence Bill kicked the dog right, is a little bit ambiguous uh, with the object agreement because both are third singular. But you get Takai and Billy Sasiki. And we know that Ia is referencing Sasiki. When you get the dog was kicked, you get Tataka Sasiki. And it's not a reduplication. Ta is actually a common Austronesian passive prefix. Mm -hmm. And with an overt agent, you get Tataka Sasiki Koe Billy. Now there you have Billy marked with an, a preposition, right? And you get no object agreement on the verb. So the dog was kicked by Bill, Tataka Sasiki Koen Billy, is really an intransitive sentence, right? And part of, we can know because it's optional and we can know because it's preceded by a preposition, the noun phrase is, and we can know because there's no object agreement. If it was a transitive sentence, there'd be object agreement. So this is a look at some of the kind of transitivity calculus you might have to do in a language. Um, it, you probably won't get an ergative language with exclusive object agreement unless you want to study Roviana, in which case, book lessons at Lango now. <laughs> yeah, these are great right. sentences. Um, and I want to call back to your the morbidity of <laughs> linguistic sentences for illustrating phenomena. Um, but you said this verb is very common, right? Kicked. Yes, so there, there was, I did get some concern um, from some of my presentations earlier on that like you're using a lot of kind of violent verbs. Linguistic violence like, <laughs> to the dog. There was concern like, are, you, are the people who are teaching you Roviana, are you kind of giving them a bad impression? Like, are you offending them? Like, and I explained, uh, of course, first of all, I'd explain to my committee, you know, the people asking me in the seminar or whatever, you know, you have to have high transitive verbs to make sure you're getting transitivity. And uh, I read some of the custom stories and I got an idea for a little, I'm not saying I can't speak for Roviana culture, of course, but my consultants, uh, the people who are teaching me Roviana, that is some people are collaborators, teachers, consultants, etc. cetera. Uh, many of them thought these things were pretty funny, particularly if mm. I would make the sentences about me, they like that a lot too. So <laughs> whatever you're learning a language, my advice is make it fun for you and whoever's teaching you and that you'll get farther. Good advice. Okay, should we move on to looking at Korean? Let's do it. All right, so in Korean, um, it's a little bit different situation. All right, so we've seen in English, the word order helps you think about transitivity, right? And in Roviana, there's object index for transitive verbs on, uh, on the verb for transitives. And in Korean, the word order doesn't really help you because first of all, it's verb final. And then the subject and object can come beforehand, but they're not necessarily always in order, right? The order is a bit more free. So let's take a look at what happens in Korean. So transitive verbs uh, that want to take an object, those are called 타동사 in Korean. And I have some nice high frequency ones here. So we have 먹다 to eat. And maybe Tyler, do you want to do the romanization for those beginners? Kamzamnida. Right. So eat. Um, and here uh, we think about something that is eaten. Right. Buda, buda to see. Yolda to open. Right. So something that must be seen and something that must be open. Oh, it's. Yeah. So this yolda is like you open the door, that sense of open? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Versus what? Versus to be open. Oh, to be open to something. Yeah, good. Yeah, good differentiation from the English sense. Open to something. All right, uh, some other great ones include joahada, to like. Chada, to kick. Mulda, to bite. And there we have our eat. Mm. Bite kick. 
and good neda to finish something. All right, and I'm gonna turn to this uh, illustrative sentence in just a moment. Um, but let's take a look at the intransitives next. These are called chadongsa in Korean. And here at the top are some high frequency ones. We have itta, which is the existential verb to exist or to have something. Mashita, to be delicious. And piryohada, to be necessary. Um, and this is the one I wanted to uh, think about kinesis for, right? Because in English, um, this works as a transitive verb, right? To be needed, to need, to need yeah. something. Yeah, whereas in Korean, um, it's actually a descriptive verb. It's intransitive, to be necessary. And this is a common error that Korean learners have is to think about uh, this need verb as the same as English. All right, now here, these next four, uh, hope you hear and see a similarity, right, to the list in the transitive section. So in Korean, there's often a transitive and intransitive counterpart. In the first case with joa hada versus jota, the one with hada, the do form, is transitive, to like something, whereas the one without jota just means to be good. So it's a descriptive verb and intransitive. And that's another big error that learners make um, is to conflate these two forms. These next three are passives. Um, and that's a huge topic in Korean too. It's a bit more advanced, um, but they're everywhere. You see that uh, something else is added here to the verb root uh, to indicate a passive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, chad on the left. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if you've seen these uh, before. Tyler and your Kaida. I've, I've seen other e suffix verbs, but not this, not this particular one. Yeah, there's a bunch <laughs> of um, passive suffixes, as you see here. There's e, ri, and na are common ones. So chada, the transitive verb kick. When we add cha ida, it means to be kicked, it becomes passivized and intransitive. Mulda, we can add mulida mm -hmm. to be to be bitten, and then gunneda versus gunnada. To so finish here something it looks, versus to be finished. Mm -hmm. It looked like the suffix is being added in the transitive member of the pair in this case. Well, na and ne look like they have a similar relation. But uh, ne is. and na, ne, yeah, na is the passivized version of it. And it's added on to actually a noun, good mm -hmm. is the end. Yeah, this good means the conclusion, the end. Mm -hmm. May have needed a different sort of passive because it already had a front vowel. And you couldn't eat it or something and be less salient. But mm. regardless of the morpho, yeah. Uh, what I think is really interesting about the comparison between the verbs that are similar on transitive and, and intransitive that clearly have a connected root mm -hmm. with a verb that seems to be nominally a stative, be good, you add something to it to make it transitive into like. But with the ones that are nominally transitive, as kick, bite, and maybe finish, although finish may be our certainly kick and bite are. Mm -hmm transparently transitive, then you add something to make them intransitive. Mm -hmm. So you can see Korean is kind of telling you with the morphology, which direction they assume, which, yeah. which category the root is in, whether it's really considered transitive or intransitive. Yeah, that's a great noticing to help you with the understanding. Um, another thing that will really help you is um, particles, right? Um, so as we said, the verb always comes on the end, right? And the word order is kind of more flexible than for example, English. So what really clarifies the meaning here is the particle or subject and object markers. Um, we're calling them case markers too, uh, the linguistic term. And we see down here, uh, transitive verbs can take an object marker, right? So let, we have our sentence, I like Korean, 저는 I, Let's mark with a topic, nun. Hangugo, Korean language, rul is the object marker here, and then chuahada is our transitive verb to like something. On the other hand, intransitives cannot take an object marker, right? So the sentence Korean is good, it's a good example. So here we have hangugo nun, topic marker chota, Korean is good, rather than hangugo rul. And that's a common. And these in Here. both these examples, we could also use the subject forms, right? Chega on the left mm -hmm. and Hangugoga 
right? Yeah, hey, that's right. Very nice. Yep, you can also change it into a subject. Now, uh, like we mentioned with dropping markers, object markers are often dropped, um, but underlyingly, yeah, they need to be there. And in fact, beginner Korean learners at Korean uh, at Lango always put them in just so we know they can go there. All right, all this great romanization. All right, another key takeaway to understand transitivity um, is that in general, all descriptive verbs in Korean are intransitive, right? So the verbs like itta, to exist, have, mashita, to be delicious, and like I said, piriohata, to be necessary, different from English need. Okay, and our last point here, and we'll see a, par a really cool parallel in Japanese. Um, some verbs have transitive and intransitive forms, and the, ver the verb hada, to do and verbify a noun. So we have in this in this example, study, kongbu, right? And in the first example, I study, 저는 공부를 해요, right? So here it's an object marked with lil. And you can translate it as I do study with the heyo part. Hey and compare that with hada, as a post-nominal verb. Mm -hmm. So here we're gonna put it together with kongbu to make a verb here. Is something coming below this line or can I can I put the Roman below? No, Roman below works. All right, good. So here we have 저는 한국어를, so I, Korean language, object marker, and then our verb is kongbu heyo, so transitive. Mm -hmm. In this case, study is kind of like unicorn hunting that yeah. study is incorporated in the verb. So you can, the first one, if it was English, is like, I'm gonna use make instead of do, just cause do can be confusing. I make study. And the second one is like, I make study Korean or no, I, I yeah. I study right, Korean. I, yeah. I, I <laughs> you can't express it the same way in English, but I, I get what's going on. And the second example, study has been incorporated in the verb. And mm -hmm. then now Korean language is the object Whereas in the previous one, study can also be an object. So this is a way of uh, dealing with transitivity calculus in Korean. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's a little tricky to perceive if you're just new to the language. But the point, I'm going to illustrate in the Roman. Here in the first one, the upper example, kongbu is a noun and it's an object, marked as an object, mm -hmm. the direct object of the doing. The thing that is done is study. Whereas here, kongbu really is in with the verb itself, you might call it incorporated. And mm -hmm. you have a, a different object now outside of that, namely Korean language. And this uh, this can be performed on many nouns. So how that can come on to um, convert it, transform it into the transitive version. All right, so let's turn to Japanese, Japanese. now. Yeah, and see some parallel phenomena. Uh, what you mentioned the particles a few minutes ago, uh, that's something that Japanese grammar also requires. Any noun phrase, any participant in the action of a sentence has a little marker with like a little flag telling you what its role is, which I find really, really helpful to find your way around. Mm -hmm. So I say that the, the property of transitive is very clearly marked, therefore, in Japanese, like many grammatical properties. You have here the object marker is this o. Ego mita. Ego movie. You can think of the Korean cognate, right? Uh, at least not cognate, but Korean cousin of this word. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Yonghua. Yonghua is the projected image. So, I watched a movie. The verb here too comes at the end of the sentence. Mita is marked past. I watched it. Shukudai is homework. Shukudai o shita. Sukje. Did. Yeah, sukje one. Yeah. I did the homework. Wish the alignment were in an intransitive clause. What's that? What's that showing there? <laughs> There's none. Took a stray thought there. Oh, we wanted to see an intransitive Oops. version. I see. Can we think of one? Some, well, we will see some later on, but what would okay. be. Um, Eigaga yokatta. The movie was good. 
Okay. Here we go. Which we should see, right? And uh, whether it's an accident or whether it's a borrowing, the ga in Japanese is the Japanese subject marker. Sounds like one of the Korean forms. Ga. One way it'll help you, yeah, if you know both varieties or if you're learning both. It'll help you. Or not every trend. Peter, go ahead. It'll help you with words without codas. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, yeah, there's um, alternation in Korean. Not every transitive construction if, of English is mirrored by one in Japanese, right? You have this, we can make a, a rough equation. Mm -hmm. We have transitive sentences in both languages, English and Japanese, but it's not a one-to-one -one match. So to express the meaning of have, like have a movie or have homework, that these guys we won't use well, because there is no direct object the way Japanese constructs these. Watashi wa eiga ga aru. So this expresses, I have a movie. And you'll notice that what to us is the object, the movie, is marked as a subject in this construction. As for me, a movie exists, is what the Japanese sentence is really saying. It exists unto me. Yeah, I think that is how it's used cross-linguistically often when they don't have a have verb. It's like, yeah, it exists to... at me or to me or something like that. Special. You might think it's a really basic concept, possession and have, but it's not treated that way in every it's not mm -hmm. a transitive verb everywhere. Look at another example. Kare wa shukudai ga aru. It's the same story. The possessor, in our view of it, is a topic, and the thing being possessed is really just the subject, the thing that exists here, homework. Homework subject. I put has, but this verb can all, we could equally well say exists. Mm -hmm. Shukudai ga aru. If no topic is mentioned, yeah, we could translate exist as it. So the mm -hmm. translation for those uh, not watching of Karewa Shukudai ga Aru is he has homework. He has homework. Thank you. That was what I forgot. And so we could leave out Karewa. We said mm -hmm. Shukudai ga Aru, there is homework. Homework exists. After what we've learned about Japanese, let's take a look. A second look now at our English verb have, which of course seems transitive. X as Y. Y is the object. We had fun. Mm -hmm. I have two loaves of bread. She has plenty of energy. So some nice different senses of have, different kinds of things you can have. Mm -hmm. We passivize these. <laughs> Again, my, my go-to test for is something truly transitive. These are fun. An easy fun one to do. We can say fun was had by us, fun was had by all, Does but can we say two loaves of bread are had <laughs> by me? Doesn't sound right to me. Plenty of energy is had by her. I think you'll agree if you're a native speaker or if you know the language well that these sound a little strange. Mm -hmm. That's why that's what this little question mark is indicating. I think common practice in linguistics to show the status. I think fun was had is only not as bad because we have idiom, fun was had by all. We didn't mm -hmm. have these idioms for analogy. It'd be even worse, I bet. So I maybe it used to be okay in a long time ago in English. No way of knowing. <laughs> Odd instructions were had by speakers of old. <laughs> if only we had time machine. Let me do field work. The written records are there, but I don't know well enough to answer that question. Uh, yeah, so after this slide, so, okay. Uh, here I wanna branch away, go, move away from that verb of having mm -hmm. and mention a couple other constructions that I give Japanese learners trouble, especially if they're coming from an English language background. There's these nice ways of saying to like, to enjoy something or to desire a thing, to want. Liking and wanting, these again, to an English speaker's mind are just transitive verbs. You've got an, an, a participant on either side when we use them. Japanese does it a little differently. Watashi wa, I topic. Kono eiga ga suki desu. That's the way we would say, I like this movie, but notice again, it's not the object marker or after the movie, it's a subject marker. So we would say, the movie is pleasing to me. It would really get a little bit closer to the Japanese construction. Mm. 
And there it is, kanji, and, so and written in Japanese. Kare wa panga hoshi des. This hoshi is really one of the two classes of adjective. Ski is not. Ski is like best label for it is a noun. It doesn't change its form at all, though it's uninflected. Hoshi hmm. is. We can have hoshikunai and so on. We can change the suffixes, inflect it. This one, the a really close English rendering would be something like, "As for him." Bread is desirable. Kare wa pan ga hoshi desu. I guess we should say hoshi so desu because we don't have direct knowledge of another person's interior state. Oh, I see. Hoshi, hoshi so. Oh, rats. What are you adding there? A suffix so of seeming. Oh, seems. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Really, we, you would only use hoshi of yourself when you have direct knowledge. Oh, okay. Cool. So just a quick takeaway for my Japanese learners. Mm -hmm. In these types of constructions with ski and hoshi and the verb, the verbs aru iru, don't use wo. You're not looking at direct objects. Use ga because they're subjects. Is this also a common error you see? Well, in classes, it hasn't come up that much, but I think it's a it's a, an easy pitfall. Mm. When I was learning Japanese, this was a problem for me. Mm -hmm. But the reverse, I memorized these skides style constructions, and I until somebody really explained it to me after I was already done studying Japanese, I I had my own idea that ga went with the object and wa went with the subject based on these constructions. And then when ga went with the subject, I couldn't figure out which. In my mind, ga and wa were two types of object markers. Yikes. Or no, ga and wo were two types of object markers because no one ever laid this out for me. And this mm -hmm. is one of those non-binary transitivity things. There's kind of two participants and they're individuated, but it's not really punctual. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I can see why it's let, it is certainly intransitive and your explanation is brilliant. I think it's super useful for Japanese learners, people like me who are learning Japanese, um, because then when you get to the verbs that alternate from transitivity, you have no idea what's going on because you've memorized ga as an object marker. So mm. can these drop out too? So can ga drop from, if you know, if it's understood from context? The, just the little, uh, particles, particles in informal speech, they're particularly like drop. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody's trying to break in here. Uh oh. One of my associates. <laughs> And of course, uh, noun phrases, the whole the whole phrases can sometimes be dropped. We can leave off the mm. topics and so on. Yeah, that These context-dependent awesome. languages. All right, now it's time for F the ineffable. Uh, we're gonna talk about some etymology folks. <laughs> etymology folks, because we're gonna talk about folk etymology. Folk etymology. So let's unpack that term real quick. Folk so, etymology. What is etymology? Uh, etymology um, is kind of where you study the history of a word, what, how the word went through time. And a folk etymology is typically when people who speak the language recognize a history of the word, but that's not actually what happened. It just seems to have happened that way. What do you think? Is that a fair definition? Pretty good. Yeah, okay, cool. um, but it, and it's also useful, right? It's not always, it can even influence, it can catch on, right? It can spread. Oh, yes, it can catch on. Yeah, it's, it's a real thing. Very cool. Tyler, you want to tell us about these English uh, folk etymologies? Hamburg. So does this mean a kind of meat? If we say Hamburg, I'm not familiar with this one. Oh, this one from hamburger, right? But what is Hamburg? My grandma calls hamburgers Hamburg. <laughs> from the German. The That's German? the name of a name of a city in German, Hamburg. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that the origin of hamburgers? The origin of the the kind of food. Yeah. So yeah. In parallel with Frankfurters and Wieners, mm -hmm. Wieners, we say they're all from names of places. But I think people so associate the, with a hamburger. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's Be a human Berlina, the, always these particular foods will get an er suffix added to the place name. Mm -hmm. Well, and that like for me, bur then it becomes burger. And ham is, even though I've always, since I was a kid, of course, the folk etymology is why is it called ham when it's a beef burger? There's no ham on it, yeah. And so then <laughs> yeah. 
some places okay. you can get a chicken burger. Yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of other burgers now. Yeah. That's true. Cool. Chili burger. So I can't say much about Hamburg aside from that. I wonder what, if your grandma, uh, if, to her, if to her the word has a different meaning if it's got the er suffix on there. Is a hamburger somebody who eats hamburgs? <laughs> I don't even Steamed know. Hams? I, I thought it was a speech error at first, but she says it a lot. I've been paying attention for a year. She says, Maybe she just knows a lot about etymology of that word. She knows I think the history the reason of words. Is, is she's so into etymology. She didn't tell me about it. Her grandson, who's a professional linguist, but she's really into etymology. And <laughs> I don't this know. Is your I grandma that likes K-pop too, right? No, but she, yeah, my aunt likes K-pop. But no, oh, your my, aunt, okay. My grandma's 98. She's, she just passed the K-pop bubble. Oh, I see. <laughs> so we've got bridegroom. And that groom, that's a uh, sort of conflation. It got, that got confused. The, er, the earlier compound was something like bridegumme. Guma was an old word for a man, a human being. But it went the, but that's the simple form there, guma, just dropped out of the language. It was there in Old English and got lost, I think, in Middle English. We no longer have a word goom <laughs> for a human. But that's what it was. It was instead associated with the, the verb to groom. Even though that's not really something that a bridegroom does. I hope he grooms himself. <laughs> No, I didn't. I didn't never associate it with to the verb to groom. Interesting. Right, groom. That's cool. It shouldn't be. It just kind of was that was done that way by speakers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Peter. So Chase Lounge. Oh, Chase. Chez. Oh, yeah, Chez. Say this one. I mm. wish you had put me on the spot. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I just also said Chase. I thought you were, started, thought you were starting to say something there, Peter. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. So here's <laughs> what it should be. Chaise is French for chair, cognate. And then it's the verb, the, not the verb, the adjective longue in the feminine form. It means a long chair. But if you look at it quickly, it's got this, that second word there has the same letters as English lounge. Mm -hmm. Lounging is something you can do on a chair. It's, it lends itself well for that. Yeah. So we associated it with that word lounge and it's seeming to establish itself pretty well. Here's chaise lounge and see it spelled that way too. A pedant will tell you it shouldn't be that way. So enjoy that insider knowledge there. So cockroach, I think this one, right, is from cucaracha in Spanish. And we backformed into cock and roach, which are two animals in English. Wait, roach isn't it? What's the roach by itself? For me, roach only means cockroach now. Mm-hmm, me too. So, Amazing. but maybe it is a name roach. What other roaches? What did we associate it with? I wonder. I don't know, but they, but the, it is a folk etymology though, because it's not from cockroach. It's we put two English words together to make it sound like cucaracha. Mm. And woodchuck, I don't recall yeah, why this um, one is wrong. Has nothing to do with wood or with chuck. It's. It just comes close in sound to a Native American word. It's a oh. North American animal. Do you know what the word is? Oh, I'd have to look it up. I don't know offhand, I'm afraid. Next time, let's include that as <laughs> <laughs> part of the preposition. But of course, folk etymology isn't just a feature of the English language. Other mm -hmm. languages do too. Japanese speakers are very, very fond of wordplay, so they coin lots of these things deliberately. It's hard to tease apart which were deliberately coined playfully and which one were due to misunderstandings. So to understand what an okushon is, we need to know that they've taken the word, the English word mansion or like a uh, condominium, that's what they apply it to. They call a condo a manshon. And you have to know that man in the Sino-Japanese counting system means 10,000. Mm. Oh, cool. the, the square of that, just like in Korean, the square of, um, of 10,000 is 100 million. And the term for that in Japanese is so a luxury apartment, a particularly expensive manshon, more than just 10,000 yen, it costs 100 million yen, so we call it an okushon. Cool. Which we translate in English as luxury apartment. Yeah. So I've got one for myself, which is uh, in 2016, I uh, noticed that a verb I've mentioned from Roviana earlier, matarutu, I even mentioned its etymology very specifically because now I know, right? Now, matarutu means fear 
it's a stative verb for fear. But without knowing the history of the verb, I immediately saw two Roviana words, mata, I, and rutu, laos. We actually var borrowed two versions of Austronesian rutu into English, one as cooties from Indonesian cooties. kutu. But all cooties. And one as uku in ukulele from uh, Hawaiian uku, which also is cognate here with rutu in Roviana, which means laos. So I thought this was this metaphorical I, uh, fear is the I Laos. Like it's just something. No, it comes from Ma Takut. And the Ma used to be a prefix. Then it became fossilized. And then they added an echo vowel after the Kut because you can't have five. So it was just a chance of history that it looked like two modern words, but it did not come from two modern words. Uh, and I was the only one who thought it did. It, the I, I don't get the impression that my Roviana friends really thought that it did. <laughs> <laughs> so this is more of, instead of a folk etymology, it's a field like linguist idiot. etymology. It's something. worse. Yeah. <laughs> it affected my perception. Etymology. First, because it's really <laughs> mataku, which is what you would, matagutu, that's kind of what you'd expect, right? But I would expect matagutu for the exact same reason I say, allophony instead of allophony <laughs> <laughs> so knowing the history they would immediately know no it's not fears the eyelaws yeah, one of my favorite examples from from literature of english although I, utopia was originally written in latin but it was by an english person uh and so based on utopia from the 16th century we now have dystopias, starting with Huxley and Orwell. They wrote some famous dystopian novels. And this is a play on words, or it's, it sort of involves word play, because the dis prefix we bought, we've taken from Greek is used to make something bad, to give a bad meaning, something like dysfunction, mm -hmm. or what's, what are some other ones? Dis, dysentery, difficulty dis in your the gut. Same dis hmm. The same dis, yeah, means not having a good time <laughs> or bad, unpleasant, undesirable is what this refers to. Mm -hmm. But that one is the, the, the opposite of this dis was the Greek prefix you. If something was good, you wanted to add the good sense you would prefix this EU spelled one. And because English speakers pronounce this you the same as the you in utopia, peculiarity of English that these merge, that they coincide, that allows, that opens up this wordplay. You couldn't really do that. For instance, in Greek, utopi for utopia versus oi in sound for the EU spelled one, but they just sound different in other languages. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's cool. We formed dystopia onto utopia as if it were the EU utopia, the good place. But utopia, this one, utopos is from the Greek for no place, nowhere. Mm. Is that the EU in Europe? Europe? Is that the EU in Europe? It looks, I mean, Europe starts with an EU, but that's not a morpheme in the word. It's from oh. a person's name. Just guessing, didn't know. It was a common diphthong in Greek. Oh, is that it? Ah, this is great though, like that. We'll be talking more about folk etymology, folk linguistics too, because uh, like we mentioned, it's important, right? It's important to think about what people say about language too. People have a lot to say about language and I want to hear all about it. Folks got feelings. Folks got feelings. Okay, I am hungry and thirsty now. So let's turn to what we're calling Chimek words for our wordplay section. Um, and this is a particular section in our forthcoming book um, dedicated to Sino-Korean compounds. Um, Tyler, you want to briefly talk about what compounds are? There's going to be a blog post soon where you uh, go into detail, but brief synopsis. But, uh, yeah, a compound word, the definition is so boring, but there's so much fun <laughs> and so interesting. You take two <laughs> things that exist as independent words, two words, stick them together and make a new one. Very nice. It's really straightforward and simple, but there's a lot of complexity and nuance involved. You can't just stick any old two words together to get a meaningful third word. But a lot of things you can. So you can you can conjoin noun with noun. That's a very common thing to do. Or you can have verbal ones, a verb and noun, or noun and verb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what else uh, sometimes, if you know some of these components, um, you, they're very sticky and they're very memorable. 
um, for the compound word. And here's our first one. So we've got Chimek, um, the name of the section in our book. Um, and it stands for Chi Chicken. So Konglish. Taken from English. Chicken, yeah. normally fried chicken. And then Mek from Mekju, the Sinocrean word for beer. Right. Three, it, piece, so Mekju is itself a compound, meaning, what do we call it? Wheat liquor. <laughs> okay. L I Q U O R. Oh, so that's how you get like shoju and. Mm -hmm. Jew, all the Jews. All the juices, yeah. Alcoholic juices. And uh, we have the character over here. And that's if you could the, do the. In Mandarin, it's my. Is how my. It. And we've got a lovely picture of it uh, fried chicken and typically some light uh, Korean mekju, like Max or Kiss. All right, our next one is similarly a fusion of a Konglish word, sink, sink, and then te. Okay, the so the blue ones, the blue components here are from Chinese and the orange ones on the slide, those are of English derivation. And that so these are, we're looking at Korean words that have one component of English, one of Chinese. So three languages involved in just these simple everyday words here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if sometimes uh, Korean speakers can trace back what is going on here because they're just, you know, so yes. high frequency. But for the learner, they should be quite delightful when you figure out what the components are. Or for the linguist. So what does te mean? Uh, it can be a pavilion or a terrace, just some any kind of raised structure, big or small. Same as in chinde, right? For the bed? Chinde, yeah, yeah, I believe so. The bed is a, a kind of terrace, pavilion, platform is a good good word for it. The next one is great. Um, it comes from gaming as, as I think a couple other ones. Um, and it's ko kwal. So this time uh, the first component is from Sino-Korean ko meaning high mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then kwal from quality. So high quality item. And the derivation from the English is similar to what happened to chicken instead of both syllables, just Chop off your favorite, that first one, quality. quality. <laughs> Chop off your favorite. And that comes from Chinese, go. Mm -hmm. Go, yeah. Good pronunciation, Peter. It's the one I knew, so I had to go for it. <laughs> Good. This one's also a great one from gaming. It comes from Sino-Korean, took, um, and then Konglish, tem, from item, like you said, yeah. Um, so a piece of the word item comes in. Not, yeah, if it was just the first syllable I, that would <laughs> yeah. not be, that's not characteristic enough. The tem right. is more, more restricted in what it can come from. Fewer tems than there are I's. I also means child, so that. <laughs> right, that yeah, that could be weird. Getting suitable. a free child, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo. And the took, the Sino-Korean meaning, so we have yeah. du. To get, it's the verb of acquisition. Okay, yeah, next good. one is wonderful. I really love all these uh, new slang words coming in with ting. Um, so the Konglish word ting is a short form of meeting. And it almost always applies to some kind of, I think, uh, dating situation. In the romantic. Yeah, so. it has a romantic connotation. Um, and a high frequency word is sogeting. Sogeting. Soge from Sino-Korean. If you'll do the... Mm, uh, Mandarin it really uses these uh, a different compound made with the you know anagram it's an anagram of it we reverse these components jie shao for introduction or introduce nice. but Korean and Japanese have them in this order and it does exist in some forms of, Chi of the Chinese language shao jie in this order shao jie so that's the part that means uh, meeting right so introduction introduction soge right soge means introduction doesn't it yeah, yeah. So we have a word, soge, um, chagi soge, right? So self introduction. Chagi soge, that's what it that is. That way. Yeah, that's probably sticky for you, Peter, because you did it a lot. So this is a really Your interesting con compound. It's a date that is an introduction and an introduction that is a date, where A is an A that is B. And the compound means uh, a blind date. So the ting comes from meeting, or, right? Meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meeting. 
It's interesting that they render that with a T, maybe influenced by the spelling, unless they had a British model, because we will weaken this T in North American speech, meeting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not meeting. I think, good, I think that sound is uh, uh, nice for slang in general. It seems to be uh, part of a lot of these. Okay, next one is so good. <laughs> no, yeah, stop. <laughs> no yeah, I just said this this morning. Um, but usually I always say I do have an answer. Um, and sometimes I will say no dap. No dap comes from English no, and then Santa Korean tap for answer. Oh, shortened that's the wrong one. I was I was reading it as uh -oh. tap. Tap. Let me just handwrite the. Uh oh. Hanja. Yeah. Wrong one. Disregard that. Banish it from your mind. The hanja for tap mm -hmm. has bamboo on the top, and this one means to reply. That tam one that I thought it was mm -hmm. is to converse to speak, but we want this hanja, and it's read in Mandarin as da, rising tone there. Nice. Very nice. Stop. So no da, no answer, but maybe there will be. Maybe this will catch on. No coming on to compounds. Maybe there will be a no dam eventually. Maybe people who <laughs> don't drink beer will be called no megs or... <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Oh, oh, yeah. Or no ju people who abstain from alcohol. Tito no do. <laughs> no do's. No do. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It used to be a kind of thing. Let's start. If it. you only tried to use your English compound components, you'd come up with really bad ones like cheating. <laughs> <laughs> cheating, a like, meeting no, with chicken. Go, oh, let's go meet and have chicken. Let's have a cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to go to Korea. They're going to love me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, outro. All right, time for announcements. Uh, so thanks for hanging in. <laughs> this is a longer lingo pod. Um, please check out our blog forthcoming. We've got a um, whole, um, whole lot of topics about phrases, right? Phrases set to stun. Um, we'll have another one on transitivity. Um, looking at Rubiana, Japanese and Korean. One on compounds with Tyler. Yeah. Eventually one on the phoneme from an earlier podcast. We want to talk more on the phoneme. So a lot yes, of blogs, please. a lot of blogs coming up soon. There's already quite a few up there from the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check them out. That are worth checking out if you haven't yet. And we're on Twitch now, thanks to Tyler. Um, so please check it out. Um, they're on YouTube as well. And um, if you've ever done Duolingo, which probably if you're listening here, you probably have, if you're a language enthusiast anyway, um, he'll give you some advice about how to use linguistics for language learning and just pointing out noticings to make your language learning process even more efficient. All right, our spring session is underway. Um, we're online and on site. If you still want to register, get at us. <laughs> you can join at any time. Uh, we've got a big party tonight for the Lunar New Year, we'll, where we'll be giving you your multilingual fortunes and talking kind of about the history and the culture of Lunar New Year around the world. Should hopefully be a good year for me. I should be able to handle it as an ox. Um, and then we've got a bunch of other prog programs going on. Uh, check out our calendar. And then questions or comments. Um, Arguments get at Peter. <laughs> Core or otherwise. <laughs> Core or otherwise. Yes. All right. Uh, see y'all next time for episode seven. Good man, Oh, and I wanted to mention my background blipped out, but yeah, here's our books. <laughs> yes, get some of the books. Get some. <laughs> and we'll see you soon. See you soon. Ciao. 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 Ciao.